crazy move that Eddie is making for AJ. Why are you not thinking, let's get him set up for kind of animal? Um, if, that was years and years and years ago. Like, Clarissa is a way different fighter from when she was Thanks for those joining me live and to those that have been joining me on our defenses that she's had to have recently. You know, she's full people. All right, what's going on, everybody? Welcome to another edition of the Ground Tape about tribalism. Uh, I don't think tribalism is necessarily bad. I just don't think it has to be. I don't know what he thinks he sees or what he thinks he knows. But he going to the hospital, bro. Like, bro, you not winning that fight. You guys mentioned, I think, D Style, you mentioned him versus Regis Program. I love that. Sounds like a. I don't need you, you know, and PBC and others, in my opinion, it's like, oh, this is my, my guy. Like, there's a relationship. Right out, it's tough, and we, we call box, and we, we go to the end of the round, and then that was all. What do you mean by acting black? That's a fair question, but a participant of trash talk knows. And they're announcing a fight three, four months from now, and he ain't going to fight. I bet you anything. He's not going to fight somebody as good as John Wright. All right, we're back with another edition of the Roundtable. And as always, we have a fabulous panel tonight. We have the best journalist in the game, the Hall of Fame, Lee Groves. And we have the very knowledgeable Jeff, a.k.a. Hot Boxing Minute, is back with us. And my partner in crime, Dangerous, D-Style Boxing is in the house. So let's just jump right in, man. This was a gigantic weekend of fights we had this past weekend and if you had a dvr you had it working over time and the big fight of the weekend was tim zoo versus sebastian fondora a lot of mixed opinions on this one the way the fight played out should tim zoo's corner have pulled him out with that nasty cut on the top of his head constantly having to brush that blood away with his glove blood going right in his eyes Virtually a blindfolded fighter in there, if you really want to be honest. Jeff, was it the right move to continue on fighting? He almost won the fight. It was a split decision, narrow split decision. Should they have pulled him out, or did they do the right thing by letting him continue on? You know, first things first, let me say that fight was stunning, just visually to watch. And I know a lot of boxing purists, They'll, they'll say in comment sections online, oh, they love the sweet science hit and not get hit. But what's left, what fans talk about for years and years afterwards are those kind of displays, those Roman Colosseum-esque type of bloodbaths. That's just how we're rigged as humans, and I, and I thought it was phenomenal. Was it crazy sways of momentum? I don't know. I don't know. I think if you were to ask Tim Zhu, in retrospect, off the record, I'm pretty sure he'd be like, yeah, we should have called it. We, we should have called it before the four rounds was up, before any kind of judging went to the cards and just revisited the fight for another day uh stitch duran triple og in the game arguably the most famous boxing cut man at the present moment he had some criticisms for the corner and uh, well, he felt the fight shouldn't have continued and i thought that was kind of out of line for stitch because it, it's it's i'm sure he's been in many of those high pressure situations where blood's gushing everywhere and you're thinking like there was so much on the line business wise it was the first big event for pbc under their new platform so far the event had gone amazingly you're looking at amazon prime executives are probably in the building watching like what's going on tim had to make a decision his corner had to make a decision he decided to keep going and there were some issues there with the blood gushing out you got to count take into account that they couldn't put you know, specific coagulants. I don't know exactly what kind of coagulants they can put in something like that, but where the cut was located at, you're limited in your approach because you can't have whatever's in there spilling into the eyes. If it's below the eyes, it's a little easier to deal with. You have you have certain leeway, but above the eye, it's it's just a mess. And when you got that warm Vaseline, it doesn't do much but gets socked off. As soon as you get punched, it flies off. Uh, I was talking to a friend of mine who was a cut man out here in San Diego, and he said one of the best tricks he heard an old cut man tell him was to freeze the Vaseline and don't take it out up until uh, the last minute possible. That way it's still partially solidified. So if you have to put it in a cut, it stays situated inside the cut and doesn't slide off as soon as you get hit. But I think in retrospect, he shouldn't have done it. When that cut first started, I believe it was after the third round, 
the CompuBox stats came in and they said Tim Zoo was landing over 60% of his power shots. And maybe Lee Groves, who's a historical guy that works well with CompuBox, might, might know a counter historical example to this. But from what I know understand with boxing, is once you get into that 50% power shots landed, you're well on your way into a landslide. That means that the person on the opposite end of that is just a few rounds away from getting stopped, either knocked out or getting a TKO. When they're landing over 50%, and he was at 60%, so it was a freight train that was gaining momentum, and it got halted. As soon as his vision became an issue, suddenly Sebastian Fundora's jab was finding a home, and it became a sneakily competitive fight. It was the battle of... A person who couldn't breathe with blood coming out of his nose and Sebastian Fundora versus Tim Zhu, the guy who couldn't see. And in the end, they gave the split decision to Sebastian Fundora. And I wasn't mad at the decision. I thought it was a highly competitive fight. I think if Tim was allowed to actually go back in a time machine and tell himself in the corner something, he would say, call the fight. What do you think, Distal? I know you've been pretty happy with the the way Tim Zhu hung in there and you like the fact that he showed toughness and the warrior mentality but at the end of the day hindsight is 2020 and if he could go back in time do you agree with Jeff do you think he would have changed his decision on continuing on look I they didn't get the result they wanted so I think the obvious answer is yes of course it would go back and look I don't think there's a debate about that um but but to me, I'd rather look at it from perspectives. Um, I don't feel guilty saying this because boxing is all our uh, guilty pleasure. Um, and, and I'll just say it. Uh, I'm, I'm glad the fight continued. I got to see a war and I, I was there in person to see it. The crowd loved it. And, and I'm not, I'm not going to focus on the negative. I'm going to give these warriors their positive that they earned that night. That's what I'm choosing to do. I'm choosing to be a spectator, right? I just think there's, there's just too much. There's nothing wrong with analyzing a situation, right? There's nothing wrong with saying, if I was in that position, what would I have done? There's nothing wrong with it. But at the end of the day, what happened, happened. And, and, and you could say they should learn from it, but they can't change. None of us could go back in time and change what happened. But I, I know I could go back and watch the fight, though. I mean, I, th this is a fight where... Both guys were dealing with their own thing. Fondora had a busted nose, breathing through his mouth. Blood was gushing out of his nose early on. And and then that was in the first round, I believe. And then he was getting banged up more in the second round. And he was given a lifeline from the boxing gods is what happened. And an unfortunate accidental elbow cut, you know, Tim Zhu. I don't think it was the pointy part of the elbow. I think it was like this part. Like, the was so tall. Yeah, that I just think, and that's why it was kind of cut in a weird angle, um, like personally. But I cannot have, like, when I, I'm watching that fight and I tweet out, these guys are savages. Like, and I don't mean that, like, in a condescending way at all. Uh, they're just built different, especially Tim Zhu, because they were honest, like, he was going through the worst of it. Right, I'm, I'm not diminishing what Fondora had to go through. Plus, Fondora's "quote unquote" injury was due to a legal punch, where Tim Zhu was from an unfortunate elbow. Um, as I'm watching that fight, I'm saying to myself, "This is what makes this sport what it is. Like, it's not just the athletic. Con a lot of sports have great athletes in them, right? Fighters are not just athletes." They're athletes, but that's not all they are. They're just they're just wired differently. None of us need to like the fact that Tim Zhu chose to continue. He probably doesn't even like it now due to the result. But we do have to respect it, right? I, I, and just my opinion, we need to, you know, give him his flowers for going through that and choosing to go through that. And... That's just how I feel about it. Um, to me, this was a display of this is why I love the sport because these guys are made of something that you just don't see in other sports. Like this, this is you know, I just don't, I just don't see this type of heart, determination, uh, and doing something everyone is saying did not benefit him, right? Like you're handicapped, you can't see. The blood's falling out one but two of your eyes. Blood is sticky. 
but stings, right? And 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 he's going through this, and I can't help but to think. I don't even think for one second that Tim Zhu was thinking about how do I find a way out of this fight. I think the whole time he was thinking, as crazy as it sounds, like like okay, as soon as they wipe my eye, I got one point two seconds to do something. Um, so and and he's thinking about strategy and how we could still win this fight throughout that whole time. I I believe what happened was like a snowball effect. Um, it happened in the second round. Tim Zhu, even though he was cut, just finished dominating Fondora in the second round, right? So maybe he thought to himself, starting the third, well, I mean, I think I'll be good, right? I'm about to take this guy out. And if Fondora lands some monster shots, a great uppercut in the third, um, and then maybe they're thinking, Let, let's see another round. Um, and, and maybe they're thinking, well, we ended now. I don't know. We want to draw. And maybe they went to the fifth round and maybe they said, that wasn't clear enough. If we stop it now, we may not get the decision. Right. And I just think it, it just snowballed out of control. And then the sixth round came along and maybe they were waiting for these clear cut rounds. that just never came. Right. And before they know it, they're in a full fledged fight and they have no clue who's winning the fight or perhaps they're feeling he's behind on the cards. Right, and they let it get out of control. I believe that's what happened. Right. Um, one last thing. I will say the doctor should have stopped it, despite what Tim's was saying. I saw Timothy Bradley say, while well, he told the doctor he could see, I don't give a damn what the fighter's saying. With a cut like that, Tim, right? The doctor should be able to use his common sense. And I don't need a PhD <laughs> to know that he can't see, right? And I never once saw the doctor, not that I saw anyway, do a test on Tim. Like, how many fingers am I holding up? Or I didn't see any of that. He just wasn't going to take his word for it. So every doctor should know that 99.9% .9 of the time these fighters are going to want to continue. Should know that, right? And one more thing. Why don't they have a mirror with them? So they could show the fighter... Tim's after the fight and at the press conference is saying, I got to go back and look at it. I haven't had a chance to look at the cut and how bad it was. Maybe if you held a mirror in front of Vitaly Klitschko when he said he could continue against Lennox Lewis, right? You know, maybe he'll be like, oh, shit, that's pretty bad, right? I remember Pauli Malignaggi after his bare knuckle fight saying, I was barely hit. I'm going to have a mark in my face. He had a big cut, right? So I think they, they should have a mirror with them to show these fighters how they're looking. Right. I, I don't know why they don't, maybe there's a reason, but I don't, I cannot comprehend why there is isn't. but the summer does. So you, you made a good point with Brad. They said that, you know, the fighter said he could see, and a lot of times if you even go back to that Vitaly Klitschko Lennox Lewis fight, when they stopped that fight, his cut was horrendous as well. That was probably, you know, in the top that's a ball fight. And this is right up there, too, in my opinion. This just goes right on that list. And you you saw Vitaly. He was like enraged, like, let me continue. Let me continue because that's adrenaline right there. Like, people have to understand, Tim, that's adrenaline in there. That's the warrior in, in, the, in the fighter. He's in fight mode, right? A lot of times you have that fight or flight. Well, we do, but you take that fight or flight that we have and you put it in a fighter times that by 10 right they're either going to go balls to the walls or they're going to be looking for the back door but once they decide they're going balls to the walls i saw vitaly klitschko he had he had a, a menacing look in his face and he he looked like he was going to take anyone's head off that was remotely close to him when they stopped that fight so again tim <laughs> it's not about what the fighter won because if you looked at vitaly's face that eye was like Looked like his tissue was hanging out, right? Lee, you, you've seen a lot of cuts in your day. I know you have. And where does this cut rank with with some of the worst ones you've seen? Um, you know, going back to the Vitaly Klitschko uh, fight against Lennox Lewis, the backstory was, was that up to that point, Vitaly Klitschko's only loss was to Chris Bird, And he was leading in the fight. It was because of a rotator cuff. He quit in the corner, and he took a lot of criticism for not fighting on with that injury. 
So then he gets really injured. It's like a 50 or 60 stitch cut against Lennox Lewis. And he wanted to prove that he was not a quitter. He was answering those criticisms that he was a quitter and he didn't want to, he, he wanted to convince everybody. And this was probably in his heart. He wanted to continue no matter what. He would drop dead in the ring to win that fight, especially since it's for the heavyweight championship of the world. And it came on like two weeks notice when Kirk Johnson pulled out. Uh, so it was a big opportunity. He didn't want to squander it and, and so on and so forth. As far as the question, as far as um, whether Zhu should have instructed the corner to stop the fight once the cut opened, in retrospect, yes. Um, and I remember watching the uh, the fight in round three, the first full round after the cut happened. Uh, I was thinking to myself, oh, okay, this is a really horrible cut. They are probably going to cut their losses, end the fight between rounds three and four, take the no contest, technical decision, whatever, live on to fight another day. And remember, the winner of this fight was going to uh, fight Terrence Crawford next because he was the number one uh, contender at 154 by the WBO. And uh, that was a big, big money fight. So all that is at stake. And, you know, Tim, you know, but, but here's the thing. Uh, because Zoo fought on with the injury and because he tried his best to win the fight, he lost, but he lost with honor, just like Vitaly Klitschko lost with honor against Lennox Lewis. He didn't want to quit. He didn't quit. Um, and so as a result, I don't think uh, Tim Zhu's reputation didn't take a hit at all. And because of that, a rematch with Bandura has a natural selling point. Up until that point, Zhu was winning the fight. He broke Bandura's nose. Blood was pouring out of his nose and mouth. And he appeared on his way to a TKO loss sometime in the middle rounds. Jeff brought up the statistic that uh, Zoo was landing 60% of his power shots. And he's correct. Anything above 50% power accuracy or above, more often than not, they win the fight and probably within, uh, you know, inside the distance. But then, um, you know, sometime in the uh, – for those people who were rooting for Zoo to win this fight, we have this what if storyline as far as selling the rematch. What would have happened if Zoo had been able to fight Fundura without any obstacle? Now, with a rematch, we would have 12 fresh rounds to find out. And from the standpoint of Fundura's fan, the rematch could be sold from this angle. <laughs> How much confidence did Fundura gain from winning this fight in this way? Remember, he was coming off a TKO loss uh, against uh, Brian Mendoza, and he had a lot of ghosts swirling around in his head. What happens if I get hit with a hard shot again? Am I going to get knocked out again? And he seemed on his way to getting stopped, and, and, and then he starts bleeding and everything. It looked like he was going down the rabbit hole. But then the cut happened, and it turns out that Zoo is hurt even worse than he was. And I think that helped settle him down. And uh, then once he settled down, he got into that very smart game plan of keeping the action at long range with his jab. Almost 61% of his thrown punches were jabs. And this is the strategy that Fundura's fans have been begging for him to use for years. You're six foot five and a half. You have a heavyweight reach. Use it. Don't lay on the inside and, and, and chop people down. You don't have to. Well, the situation called for him to stay at a distance. He did. He won the fight. I had it 115, 113 for Fundura. And, uh, you know, he did it. He grew as a fighter, both technically, since he used his height and reach, and also uh, spiritually, because he showed that he could overcome his own injuries. And now, you know, uh, it's it's a uh, it's a fight that we didn't know was going to happen until ten or so days until it actually did, and now we had a storyline that came totally out of the blue, totally unexpected. We got a totally unexpected result, 
and boxing came out the other side of pretty good in pretty good shape. So yeah. I like what you said there about you know the cut and everything, but and yeah, and you kind of you know alluded to the fact that what they 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 could go into this rematch saying, well, what happens without the cut? Now let's kind of spin that a little bit too on Fondora's side because Samson Lukowitz, Fondora's promoter, is trying to say that that he was injured worse than Zoo. Now most people are going to disagree with that when they look at how 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 Zoo was bleeding in comparison to how Fondora was bleeding, but. The way the way Lukowitz was saying, oh, well, he broke his nose. He has to get surgery on it. Our our injury was just as bad, if not worse. So could they try to throw that into it? Like say, well, what what, 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 what we have done if we didn't have a broken nose? Do you think they can go that angle when they try to you know put forth this rematch as well on their side? Um, sure, sure they can. There are all sorts of storylines that could be used to sell the rematch. Um. It, it, it could be seen as a make sure fight. Zhu was a heavy favorite going into the fight. Most people expected him to win and probably win by knockout, considering that Fundura just lost by knockout and he was coming off after a near year, nearly year long layoff. He had a lot of things working against him. Um, so, yeah, de definitely they could work it. And, and, you know, a make sure fight, the B side win. So you pair them up again to make sure that the B-side fighter that everybody thought was the B-side is actually the A-side fighter and that he's actually better. Who knows? It might turn out to be a trilogy for all we know. Yeah. yeah. And I I think that Zhu would definitely be the favorite in the rematch. And I, I think I'd be hard-pressed to find many people who wouldn't pick him to win the fight in the rematch based off what you saw. Him being that... Go ahead, go ahead, Dista. Go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, and I think, and I see people say, look, everyone has the right to their opinion. I mean, I've seen people say, I don't like to see guys all bloody like that, but like, you guys aren't watching tennis, like you're watching boxing. Like, what? Like, I mean, so I have to question, like, what, what do you like about boxing? Like, it can't be all oh, they're great athletes because a lot of sports have great athletes, right? It can't be all oh, the athleticism, the competitive spirit. Well, all sports are competitive, right? Like, th there is a violence in boxing that we like. Like, to say we, we don't like the violence in it, uh, now, I'm not the, I'm not saying you have to like that level of it, but we're not that far apart is what I'm saying, right? Um, I get it. This was a special kind of bloody. Like, these guys were painting each other with their gloves. I don't think I've seen a fight like that. Like, every time they would land a punch, like, like you could see, like, the blood. Like there was no dispute that the punch landed. You know what I mean? Like I remember for there was any jabs, and it was you could just see the blood on the mouth of Zoo, and and when Zoo would land a, a body shot, you could just see like the like the, the mark on it. Um, it. It was it was it was crazy, right? I get it, right? And maybe all that, maybe that's I get that that's like maybe a threshold of blood that's maybe a little too much for somebody, right? All I know is this. When, when a fighter makes a decision and, and, and putting aside the corners and the doctors, but they make a decision to continue when it makes no rational sense to continue, right? You have a choice to frame it however you choose to frame it. You can choose to frame it as, oh, wow, he's stupid. That's the decision you're going to make, right? I'm not going to frame it that way. Now, for these warriors for the um, I'm going to frame it as the two warriors in it, right? That for our entertainment, especially since you put himself in extra arms way, and I'm not going to call it stupid, like I've seen a lot of people say, I'm not going to call it dumb, I'm not going to call it any of that, because then I, I, I do question that a lot of people. Like, what do you think you're watching? It's been not how you guys I hate to interrupt you, but I, th I think you're having some audio issues with your mic. It's kind of muffled. I don't, I don't know if, what's, if it's, it's one of your settings. If you could kind of sort that out a little bit, if you can. How does it sound now? Go ahead. Say, talk again, please. I don't know. How does it sound right now? Much better. Much better. Okay. So uh, all I'll say is this. You could f choose to frame uh, ho however you want. A fighter going like you know you know what I mean like going into the lion's den 
handicapped like that and choosing to do so. I understand it doesn't make rational sense, but if you watch boxing long enough, you should know that fighters make unrational decisions all the time, right? And me, that's why I love the sport, because these guys are made of something else. They're wired differently than normal people, right? And that's why I love the sport, right? And if you want to have a, if you want to have a stance like the corner should have saved him from himself, that's a different argument. But unfortunately, I'm just seeing fans frame this whole situation as Tim Zhu was dumb. Tim Zhu made a stupid decision. And, and if you do that, I just, me personally, that's just not how I choose to frame it, pretty much. Yeah, I, I see both sides of it because when you, I mean, I've been critical of the decision, but I have not been critical one ounce towards his decision making. I was more so critical of the corner. The corner has to save the fighter from himself. And I thought they should have stepped in and said, hey, listen, I thought the cutman should have stepped in and said, hey, listen, I can't stop the bleeding. Um, it's just going to get worse from here on out. They should have did it. Um, to say, to criticize Tim, I think is very, very unfair because once again, the adrenaline's flowing and he's a fighter. He's going to want to continue to fight. He is the warrior. And as much as I hate that word being used sometimes, I think it's it's not always the best word to use because sometimes when you say the word warrior, usually warriors back in the medieval times fought to the death. I don't want to see that. But yeah, this this was definitely the closest thing to a horror movie that I've ever seen when it came came to the blood. This was as gory as it gets. So let's jump into the fight of the night, the man who stole the show, the man everybody was sharing for it seemed it seemed like he was the headliner and not tim zoo with all due respect and not sebastian dora isak cruz and he beat raleigh romero every second and every minute of that fight and the odds makers had it pretty close they had isak cruz as the favorite but he was like a two to one favorite and the way he performed, he performed like he was a 15 to one favorite. This was as one sided as it gets. Lee based off of this performance is Isak Cruz going to be a, uh, a handful for the rest of the guys at 140. Is he undersized at this weight? Should this be a one-off or should he go back down to 135? What do you think is the best course of action for Isak Cruz moving forward? very well against Raleigh. Uh, before I go on, uh, if you want to check out a real bloodbath beyond what we saw last Saturday night, there was a Bantamweight title fight in the 80s between Raul Gibaro Perez, and he was defending against an Argentine in Lucio Lopez. There was a big height difference. Uh, Gibaro's like 5'11", Lopez 5'2", so it's very similar uh, as far as the physicality was concerned. But there was a headbutt very early in the fight, and they gushed blood throughout the entire fight. They wore white gloves. They were caked in red. Their whole torsos were were covered in crimson. And it was an action, action, action fight. So if you can find that fight, watch, watch it. Uh, I, I think that uh, you won't be sorry as far as just seeing the cores of these two men, very similar to what we saw Saturday night. But as far as Isaac Cruz is concerned, uh, you know, why, why give up a championship unless you have a bigger fight down the line at 135? Suppose Tank says, yes, I will fight you in that rematch. That's what that's the fight that Isaac Cruz has been thirsting for all along. It, but it doesn't seem like Tank is going to go that way. So might as well, you're a champion at 140, you might as well stay at 140. Uh, you're you're going to be short at 140, you're going to be short at 135. So what have you really got to lose? But um, as far as where he stacks up among the champions, the lineup of champions, this is the deepest division in boxing. And before Saturday, there was a real huge gap between Raleigh Romero and the three other champions. Devin Haney, Subiru Matias, Diafima Lopez, uh, both in terms of talent and in terms of credibility, especially because of the way Raleigh won the championship. Um, the only metric in which Raleigh could really compare to the other three was marketability. 
uh, because for all of his flaws as a fighter, and there are many of them, his greatest strength was his ability to generate interest and to generate money. And that's really the bottom line in boxing. But everybody knew, you know, any, anybody who knows anything knew that Raleigh would probably lose the title in his first defense. The question was, who was going to be the lucky guy to be standing across the ring from him? And it turned out it was Isak Cruz, uh, who probably deserved this title shot against uh, against Raleigh about as much as Raleigh deserved his title shot against Barroso, because Isak Cruz never fought at 140 pounds, yet he was rated, I think, number five in the WBA for whatever reason. Um, and, and you know what? As expected, Cruz dominated. He got inside. He hurt him early. And, and um, you know, he hurt him several times. He staggered him. Uh, and then he ultimately finished it. But what really struck me about this whole scene was the crowd reaction. Now, mind you, this fight was in Las Vegas. Raleigh hails from Las Vegas. You would think that as the hometown guy, he would get a lot of support. But instead, when his name, when his picture was on the on the big screen, boo! He comes into the ring, boo! Every time he got hurt. Yay! You know, and, and it wasn't just yay. It was, it was, it was vociferous. It was, it, it, it was like the, it was coming from their souls that they really wanted this guy to get hurt. And you know, there's a German word that perfectly describes what happened in this fight, and that's Schadenfreude, and that's defined as taking great joy in someone else's pain. Now, to his credit. Uh, Raleigh, when he was interviewed at, in the ring afterwards, he ignored the booze. He thanked everybody for coming out, and he wished them a happy Easter, and that was pretty much that. I don't know whether he was fit to do the interview in the first place, considering he just got throttled. But, you know, he handled the situation probably the best way that he could. He was humbled. He, he ceded the stage to, uh, to the new champion, and he got the heck out of there. But uh, as... Now with Cruz being the new champion, I still see him as number four, but the gap between number four and the other three guys, um, you know, has closed considerably because Cruz won the championship. Honestly, he knocked out the champion. He dominated the previous champion. Um, but, you know, Haney, Haney's number one on my list. He, he's on everyone's pound for pound list. And in winning the title, he beat the man who was the man in Breach's program. Uh, the, sec the race for second place, I think, is very close. In terms of star power, Teofimo Lopez deserves the spot. But in terms of in-ring ability, I think Matias is next. After all, he made his last five opponents quit on their stools, and four of those guys were undefeated coming into that fight. Now he's fighting another undefeated guy in Liam Paro, and I wouldn't be surprised if he made Paro quit. So for me, it's Haney, Matthias, Tiafimo, and Cruz, with two and three being very, very close. It depends on what you're looking for. Yeah, I mean, can if can Cruz beat any of those guys though, Leo? Like, who would he have the best shot against? Because I think Devin Haney's in reach would be too much. I think. Uh, Tiafimo Lopez's speed and movement would be a little too much. And I think Matias would probably be the best matchup for him because that's a guy that's going to stand there with them, right? True. Uh, but, you know, Tiafimo has had, you know, uh, with, with the exception of the Josh Taylor fight, Tiafimo struggled at 140. He, yeah, you know, he, he has struggled some at 140. And he's not a, a, an overly big guy at 140 pounds. So physically speaking, I think that Cruz, you know, Tiafimo is closer to Cruz as far as uh, the, the metrics are concerned. But, um, you know, when Tiafimo is right, he's very, very right. But when he's wrong, you know, things can really go south. And a guy like Cruz who's pretty, you, you know, you, you know what you're going to get with Cruz pretty, pretty much every time out. We don't know whether he had problems outside the ring or, or, or if life is good with Cruz. We know pretty much what's going on in Tiafimo's life by the way he fights in the ring, with the exception, of course, of the Josh Taylor fight where he did have trouble outside the ring, and yet he focused because it was a big stage for a big prize for a championship, 
he rose to the occasion. Um, yeah, I think you're right, Beeb, about the style matchup. Uh, I think the best fight would probably be with Subriel Matisse because both are aggressive, they throw a lot of punches, and they have power. I'd like to see that fight, but we'll see if, uh, you know, Subriel Matias gets by Paro. I think he will. And let's hope, let's see unification. Let's see unification. Yeah. That, that's the yeah. most beautiful 11 letter word in the, in, in the boxing. And I, and I also yeah. do, do agree with you about this 140 pound division being hot. And it's kind of between this division. And I would, I would also say um, 154 is, is, is really hot too. Because you got Crawford going up there, you got Spence going up there, you got Zoo, you got Fondora, you got Lubin. Um, that division's red hot as well, too, I would say. That's right there. That and 140. Uh, Lyndon, we're talking about Isak Cruz and how he stole the show. What do you think he does at 140 moving forward? How do you think he stacks up with the other guys? Um, he, he does seem to be a bit undersized for this division in comparison to the other guys. What do you think the landscape looks like for Isak Cruz moving forward? Uh, firstly, apologies for being late, guys. I'm on lots of oh, no problem. Not, not a problem. On, um, Eastern time, so apologies about that. Uh, look, very, very impressed uh, with um, Isaac or Isaac Cruz, how I have a, uh, pronounce it. But no, he was awesome. Uh, I know he's been compared to a, a Mike Tyson type for the, for the performance, but he was definitely on a mission. The only problem is, is he, his style is not – well, it is really suited to the likes of Devin Haney and Tiafimo Lopez, who are a very slick sort of boxers. So I think he would have difficulty with them. Um, maybe Matias, he, he could be a chance. But out of the four champions, you'd probably put him at three or four, I would think. But either way, how great would those fights be if they uh, actually got them together? Okay. Jeff, is Isak Cruz going to be your new dark horse at 140? I know you like uh, sometimes the uh, some heroes. Do you want to be on some heroes? Um, well, first off, I think, Joe, your mic was having going out, or I'm not sure what that was about. Can you hear me? I can <clears throat> hear you perfectly, yeah. Okay. Um, Isak Cruz, uh, an interesting character in boxing. I remember when I first started talking about Isak Cruz after the, the Jesse Magdaleno fight or, or whoever that was, where he was kind of first developed the moniker of being the Mexican Mike Tyson. And oddly enough, based on different platforms, you'll see like in general what kind of casual boxing fans think of specific fighters. And and on, on Twitter, there's a lot of casuals, but for the most part, I think most critically or semi-critical minded boxing fans kind of know what they're getting with Isak Cruz. On TikTok, especially with the youngsters, man, he resonates so big. And he's been huge with these young boxing fans who are relatively inexperienced. Um, I, I'm not, I never was particularly sold on Isak Cruz. I, I love his style. I remember the hell I caught for agreeing with the judge's decision that Tank Davis had beat him. That's what I saw. It was awesome, his performance this weekend against Roley Romero. I think a lot of people expected that. Um, I am partial to Rollies because I just think he's a hilarious class clown. And I personally found them both going into this fight to be very flawed fighters with exploitable gaps in their styles. And I thought it was going to come down to who would land first. So I was like, I think Rollies going to get the win. I was very wrong about that. I can eat my crow on that. You know, the 140 division, since a lot of the 135 pound guys have moved up into it, has recently become the hot division, and I agree that 154 division is looking really good too. Isak Cruz, as far as where I think he compares with the rest of the other fighters, I think that if there's one thing Giovanni Cabrera showed us is that if you can box competently and box well off that back foot and counter, you're going to give him severe problems. Throw in some pop behind you, and I think you're going to really, really give hell to Isak Cruz. So I think stylistically, I think Devin Haney, and a counterpuncher's counterpuncher in Tiafimo Lopez would be a very bad style matchup for Isak Cruz. A highly entertaining fan spectacle would be him versus Subriel Matias for obvious reasons. They're both kind of goons that like to press forward and like to press the issue. And I, and I think that is an explosive fight when it does happen. I would probably fare Subriel Matias. I think out of that division in 140 pounds, 
I would argue that the most skilled boxer might be Devin Haney. But as far as who's the most just scariest fighter, like, I think it's Subriel Matias. Like, regardless of what you think about his technical deficiencies, with Subriel Matias, it's a fight. It's going to be a hard night of work. No matter who steps in there with, in the ring with him, you're going to have issues with that guy just because he's a zombie. And, um, yeah, but Isa Cruz, I, I'm down to see him unify with anybody in the 140-pound division. It, it was a great win, and, and I'm glad to see any fighter get paid off this sport. His social media presence exploded after that fight with Rollies. He went up something like three or 400,000 followers overnight on Instagram. My hat's off to, to Isak Cruz for his newfound success and him getting a title at 140 pounds because I, I find him to be a very, very limited fighter. But what he's good at, he is really, really good at that peekaboo and the wide loopy hooks and cutting off the ring. He's really good at that. I'm with you too, Jeff. I actually felt bad for Raleigh at the end of the fight. Man. Everyone was shitting all over him, and they're like, they were happy that that he that he lost and stuff, and they were really dumping on him. Even even Jordan Plant was like, "Oh, I, what happened? I thought you said you were gonna knock him out. I thought you said you were gonna knock him out, Raleigh." <laughs> She's like, "It's a, it's she a was, catch twenty. It's a catch yeah. twenty two with boxing fans. Boxing fans, if you don't say anything, you don't buy the fight. If you speak up, they hate you for it." That fight had to be sold regardless, and it wasn't going to be on the back of Tim Zhu. It, it was Roley's big ass mouth. It was Roley's Chihuahua Cruz chain. It was it was Roley saying, "What do you do to dogs when they get out of line? You put them down." Roley was the one going viral. People yeah. watched that fight because they either wanted to see Roley get knocked out or see Roley win. Keith Thurman pulled out. I, I don't think there was really any legit interest in in Keith Thurman to begin with, but Roley moves the needle because he's just that guy. And I don't know if asking a person that's concussed questions after getting beat like that is a good idea, but I felt bad for Rollies because I've been in sparring sessions that were pretty tough, and I can see myself having trouble formulating words after sparring sessions, and I'm just like, why am I still sparring? You know, And I'm not in here with eight-ounce gloves and no headgear against world-class guys. You know, I'm just guys at my gym. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. Dista, I know Isa Cruz is one of your favorite fighters, so you must have been happy when you saw this. What do you think your man does at 140? Well, first, you could hear me good now, right? Mike's Absolutely. good. Okay. Perfect. Yep. Look, first of all, I, I did wonder, like, I go back a little bit. I, I was wondering, like, when, when the date was kind of not going to be early March, when like all the Australians were there for the, I think it was a rugby game or something, right? I, I thought, yeah, like like that. It was rugby, right, Lyndon? Am I right about that? Yeah, rugby leg. Yeah. Okay, so I was like, man, they missed the boat right there. That would have sold out the the arena. Now I was wondering, if it was going to be half full. I'm like, man, they missed this one up. But I'm going to tell you right now, the man of the the man who, who at least brought a lot of the fans over was Isak Cruz. Mm. Right. Pitbull Cruz, half of that arena was barking. They were going crazy. It was the loudest ovation of the night. It was the loudest during the fight. It was the loudest after the fight. Pitbull, that, that was Pitbull Cruz's, for the, most of the crowd was this crowd, which was very surprising to me. But at the same time, maybe it shouldn't be. Um, it would have shocked me if at least bottom man, at least one fourth of that crowd bought tickets to watch Pitbull Cruz fight. It, it wouldn't shock me at all, and it's probably higher than that. Um, and believe it or not, I saw some people leaving after the Pitbull Cruise fight. I was like, where are you going? Like, you know, but but either way, not a lot, but there was a noticeable amount. Um I I knew this fight wasn't gonna be competitive, right? Because I always knew Raleigh just didn't belong at that level. Um that moment at the end where everybody's making fun of Raleigh, I don't really put that onus on Raleigh. I put it on the people that put him there, right? You threw this man in there with a, with a fucking pit bull when he didn't belong in that ring like that, right? You, you made this guy believe he was world-class when he wasn't. You made him believe he was at that level when he wasn't. And the enablers from the sanctioning bodies to, to Tony Weeks to PBC to uh, Leonard Allerby and Mayweather, all you guys uh, – this train should have stopped when you gave him that gift against Marinas years ago. All right. So this this was a, a enabled behavior. Um, I remember seeing videos of Raleigh just kind of 
talking about how easy boxing is, he doesn't understand why people think it's so hard. And well, it looked kind of hard to me uh, during that fight. I can tell you that, right? So, Isak Cruz showed everybody that he was levels above Raleigh that night. Like, that, that's what he showed. And and I don't know what's going to happen to Raleigh, but before I talk about Cruz, I just want to say this about Raleigh, though, in fairness. What I'm not going to do is, look, I'm not going to pretend I like Raleigh because I don't, right? But I do respect him because at the end of the day, he still laces him up, he still steps between the ropes, and he still fights in the ring, right? So I, I'm not going to be one of those guys like, like mocking him and, oh, what are you going to say now, Raleigh, and this and that. But what, most of the people saying that have never been in the ring, right? So, so like it's whatever to me. I still have a lot of respect for him as a fighter for getting in the ring and putting his money where his mouth is by actually stepping in the ring. And one, and one more thing. Of all the trash talking I've heard and fighters saying very personal things to each other, like Raleigh's trash talk was very like lighthearted. Like, wow, we called him a chihuahua. Like, like he was obviously trolling and, and just it, it wasn't like really personal. Like, I just don't know why people are so mad at Raleigh. I, that doesn't make, doesn't make sense to me. And fancy to decide well, what, so what do you want? You keep telling these fighters to, to sell the fight to you and you want shoving and, and you're calling Canelo and, and, and Mungia boring and, and all these guys are boring. Uh, they just sat there and they just uh, said good things about each other. Uh, I want them to talk shit. Why do you want Mungia to talk shit? So when he gets knocked out by Canelo, you, you could just throw it in his face and mock him? Is that why you want him to do it? Like, what's going on? How about you just let these fighters be themselves, right? And that's it. Right, but as far as Pitbull Cruz, this probably won't happen. But I would love to see him go back to 135. I think he's more effective at 135 pounds. I think he's a beast there. I think he beats most guys there at 140. I just don't see him beating like a Devin Haney. I don't see him beating Teofimo Lopez. I I just don't. Um, but I think Matias beats some. I would like to see Regis Progress against Pitbull Cruz. I think that that'll be a war. I think it's a great fight. Um, and and it'll kind of let us know what progress is. But but I, I think even progress might be able to pull it off against him. I, I would like to see it. So I, I would like to see him go back to 135 personally. I think Pitbull Cruz is far better than people give him credit for. I think he had a phenomenal performance against Tank. I think Tank Davis and Mayweather and that whole crew over there gaslighted people successfully almost by saying, oh, because Tank didn't take him serious. Oh, t -t -t Tank had an injury going into the fight. Like, I don't know about all that. I don't know about Tank's hand being injured when he was throwing haymakers with that same hand for half the fight until you hurt your hand. There's clips of it where Pitbull Cruz blocks the uppercut and and after that, like you could see, like it twists his, his wrist. And after that, that's when Tank Davis wasn't throwing the hand no more. So I don't, I don't want to hear this whole like, like whatever it is. But I think one thirty five is his weight class. Personally, I think that's where he belongs. I I would like to see him go back there. Well, will he? Will he not? I don't know. But I'll say this: when Pitbull Cruz fights, I will watch. I'm a fan, and it doesn't matter who he fights. I think we're gonna get the Barroso's fight. That is a barn burner. You know what I mean? And uh, I think uh, he's going to put the old man out, is what I think, quite frankly. So that's how I feel about it. And just to go back to the point you made about let the fighters be themselves. I mean, these guys are going in the ring. They're not playing tiddlywinks. They're not playing hopscotch. They're going in there to take each other's heads off. So, of course, before the fight, you're not, they're not going to play nice with each other. They're not going not, to – not always our fighters are going to kiss each other's ass and – go overboard with with the gushing of respect and you know i mean it, things get heated in there man this is this is fight right mm -hmm. this is battle it's what it is so let's let's jump back to fondora and and zoo for for a little bit here because seems like um samson luke has been making the rounds doing all these interviews i got a chance to catch up with him and one day he says one thing, another day he says another thing. First, it's it's going to be Fondora versus Spence because that's where the money is at. That makes the most sense. Then he had an epiphany. <laughs> and the next day he's like, oh, I want to keep my word. I, I, I said that I would give uh, Tim Zoo a rematch, and I'm going to honor that. So now I'm going to act on honor, right? First it was money. Now it's honor. 
something tells me there's something else going on behind the scenes, but anything can happen. He said anything can happen in boxing. He's saying that he doesn't believe that Fondora will be ready until November. He's saying that even Zume fights Spence in between and then fight Fondora after that. This whole thing just seems like a big mystery. What do you think, B-Style? What happens next? Fondora, is it going to be Fondora Spence? Is it going to be Fondora Zou? How do you think this whole thing plays out? Yeah, you know, um, it's hard to – like the the whole suspension thing and the to secure the cut, and that's making it more difficult to kind of – I feel like I'm in a forest and there's a lot of leaves and trees in the way. It's hard to kind of navigate it. Um, but I do actually believe that that rematch is going to happen. Um, I think what well, people don't realize about Crawford, Crawford wants way too much money, man. And unless Crawford brings his price tag down, he, do I believe Crawford deserves every dime he wants? Yes, he's a, he's a three division lineal champion, two division undisputed champion. I I believe he's the best pound for pound fight in the world. So does he deserve it? Sure, but it's not like I got the money to give him give him that what he wants. You know what I mean? I could I could think he deserves it all he wants, but who's gonna pay him what he wants? You know, so like. I don't know if Crawford's going to get that shot. And somebody could say, oh, but the WBO ordered it. Okay, but WBO ain't paying Crawford. The WBO is just getting a cut out of Crawford. That's all they're getting. Oh, but the WBO couldn't order a, a purse bid. Of course they can. But if, if the promoters don't put up the money that Crawford wants, because not just what Crawford wants. is The, the purse bid's like a percentage. So whatever the percentage is for Crawford, it needs to be what Crawford wants, and you've got to pay the opponent. So maybe a promoter puts up the money. Maybe Eddie Hearn, maybe Bob Arum does. I don't know. But what if nobody puts up the money? Then what? Well, what's Crawford going to do? He's got to bring down his price tag. That's that's number one. And it's Spence. Um, look, yeah, you could show. First of all, you don't even look in shape, dude. Like, like I mean, Spence looked like a super middleweight up there. Like, I, I, I'm just like, okay, so, so when are you going to fight Spence? Like, you know, what, what What are we doing here? And is Spence going to wait six months for Fundora? Maybe he will. He's not a stranger to that. But at the end of the day, um, it's not like there's anything that makes him a mandatory or anything that really stands out in terms of, of any of that for Spence. So so I just I think the plan was for Tim to win, and then they would have done the, the Spence fight. But I just don't think PBC is interested in Fundora versus Spence. And I believe that's the reason Samson Lukowicz just all of a sudden said said he's all it's all about honor, right? It's about honor on on Sunday, but not on Saturday. Who knows what it's going to be on Monday, right? Like it's just he's just changing around as he goes. And I cannot stress this enough: everyone's just going by hearsay. Oh, there was no rematch clause in in, in writing. How do you guys know that? Did you look at the contract or what? How, how do you know? That's what people are saying. Right, because I can't help but um, like say the following: like I know the the promoter of No Limit was was sitting there getting an interview while he's listening to Samson say, and he's and he's saying to him, and he keeps saying to the media, he knows there's a rematch clause. I'd like to see him get out of this one. And what a coincidence that the next day Samson found his heart. He must have dropped it somewhere in the regular strip, right? And then and then he found it. Oh, wait a minute. I'm a, I, I, I totally forgot that I'm a man of honor because men of honor totally forget that they're men of honor, like just randomly on Saturday night. That doesn't make any sense to me, right? If I were to guess, and I am a betting man, so if I were to be a betting man, which I am, I think we're going to get the rematch. I think it's the fight that makes more viable sense. I don't think the market has anything to really pay for Dura and Spence. I don't. It's just not a big money fight. And I don't think Crawford's in that picture either. I don't know what they're going to do with Crawford. I'm not saying it's going to be for the WBO belts or something like that, but it might just be for the WBC. But I do think Fondora will be fighting uh, Tim Zhu later this year. If I were to guess, I think that's what I believe is going to happen. I tweeted that out after the fight. I said, at the time I said June, but that, I don't know about that. That's not going to happen. But later in the year, I think we get the rematch, and I'll say this: um, I have a lot of respect for Fundora. The, you know, he's a warrior and and all that, and, and he don't got a shot. 
I never seen a guy get a win and he's going to be a massive underdog in the rematch. I'll just say that, you know, uh, he's going to be a massive underdog. I, I think he was on his way to get knocked out. Right. And, and I'm mad because I lost my parlay. I'm mad because I lost my one through six KO bet. And we're going to get it back. I'm going to get that money back that night. That, that's what I'll say. I think Tim's who knocks him out in four in the rematch. Yeah, um, Jeff, I, I'm highly skeptical that this was just a handshake deal. I, I give Tim Zhu and his team a lot more credit than that. And I have a hard time also that this guy out of this part, all of a sudden, he can say, hey, yeah, we're going to get to the rematch. I think someone pulled him aside, EPT, and said, hey, man, we can talk about this. I can't, I can't hear you, Joe. Is that just me? Uh, can you guys hear me? You know what? Remove the uh, background noise reducer. Just remove it because I removed it and that fixed it for me. I can hear you know. now. Okay, hold on. All right. Can you hear me now, Jeff? Oh, yeah. Okay. I had to change the setting. Maybe that maybe that was the setting. I think when you raise your voice sometimes – that that background reducer yeah. kind of cut, cuts you off. I think when you when you speak, but sometimes I speak loud, like I have a high pitched voice. So, yeah, let, let, let me get back to what I was saying. I apologize for that. I, I I'm like D style. I I am very skeptical, and I find it very hard to believe that there wasn't a rematch clause in writing here. And I do think someone from PBC said, "Hey, man, did you read the contract?" I mean. <laughs> you you can't fight Spence. You have to give this guy a rematch. It was in the contract, and that's why I think he kind of changed his mind. Uh, you know, the, the following day, I thought I think someone got in his ear. What do you think? Uh, do you think that these guys are going to be ready in November? Do you think there's going to be an interim fight? How do you think this whole thing plays out? Oh goodness, so much uh, smoke and mirrors and art of misdirection and. People so mad at Samson Lukowicz. Uh, I, I could say, I, from what I've observed, most of the people who are mad at Samson Lukowicz are hardcore Canelo fans or fanboys or whatever you want to call them. I'm a Canelo fan too. Not enough to where I just get mad or you know illogical about certain things. Samson Lukowicz is a promoter, you guys. So, you know, like, I, I'm going to give you some free life advice. This is what uh, I've observed in life. You know, politicians, lawyers, salesmen, which is what promoters are. You know, they, they sell something. They all go in that snake oil basket to be good at their job. They've got to be borderline sociopaths. So you, you, you can't be mad at them for being what they are. That's what they have to do to thrive in their selected line of careers. As long as you know that when you're dealing with them in life, you should be fine. Don't get emotional. You're letting them win. As far as Samson Lukowicz, like I know this, he's never been sued by any of his fighters. That makes him all right by me, because when push comes to shove, I'm always going to support the fighters first, regardless. And um, Samson now says all kind of crazy nonsense. And one day he'll say one thing. I've seen him in interviews change narratives within a five-minute period, but I will give Samson L his credit, much like Mauricio Suleiman is. He'll sit in the hot seat, and he'll let you throw as many monkey wrenches as you want at him, and he'll take them all with a smile and look at you without flinching. That's a cold, cold businessman right there. Um, during the post-fight interview, Sebastian Fundora said, you know, we all saw, obviously, uh, a relatively chunky Errol Spence step in the ring looking like he hasn't stepped in a gym in a few months and say he wants that fade next. And then Sebastian Fundora in the post-fight interview said he wants to fight the best fighter in the world, Terrence Bud Crawford, clearly. And then, of course, Errol Spence stepping in the ring opened up all the wounds from the Errol Spence fans in the state of Texas as far as that, you know, that third car crash a la Terrence Crawford that happened to him. And all of a sudden the war exploded online. The money fight is with Errol Spence. The money fight is with Errol Spence. To the Errol Spence fans, I hate to burst your bubble. Yesterday's price is not today's price. That's not how it work, bomb a clock. You know, um, I don't care how nice the Rolls Royce is. If it's been a not one, not two, but three car accidents, three car crashes, and it has a salvage title on it, that Rolls Royce is not the same price it was before all those car crashes. Errol Spence's market value was not the same. 
Not saying he doesn't deserve a chance to fight for a belt, but not in this very situation. I think the right thing to do would be a rematch with Tim Zhu. And just like you were going on about Joe, I refuse to believe that Tim Zhu walked into enemy territory in a foreign country without getting all of his P's and Q's dotted correctly as far as having the rematch clause. Um, the manager for Tim Zhu, I heard him in an interview, I think it was in the boxing voice, and uh, he said, you know, what happens next is a discussion for Monday, so he wasn't really clear on whether or not there was a rematch clause or not. I don't know where the most finances would be as far as that fight. Obviously, the money moves, where the, the, the fight occurs where the finances go to. So you got Paco Valcara with the WBC who says, Terrence, before the fight even happened, the Terrence Crawford already invoked his Super WBO champion status in that little small rule in Chapter 4, Sub-Article 3-A, where he can, I made up that number, by the way, where you can fight the division up and you get first crack at the title. And, and then, you know, you got Sam Sedell saying something completely different. You had Errol Spence stepping in the ring. You had Sebastian Fundora who says, I want to fight Terrence, you know. I, I think uh, Tim Zhu is going to get that fight next. I don't know what, what Terrence Crawford and Errol Spence is going to do. I believe there's more money in the Terrence Crawford fight. Just as far as pay-per-view sales, I think you can possibly sell out a stadium with some cheap seats for Errol Spence versus, you know, Fundora in Texas. But I believe a pay-per-view upside will be higher with the Terrence Crawford fight. But what do I know? The right and just thing would be to run it back. I think there was much more compelling storyline in what happened with Tim Zhu and Fundora in that first fight to get a lot of interest from fans and I think all the parties are going to lead to going in an inevitable direction I think the easiest fight would be the rematch and, and from way from looking at it, as many possibilities as I can look at the Rubik's Cube but um, yeah I, I think the rematch is what happens next despite all the smoke screens and everybody being mad at Samson Lukowicz for being a promoter he's a promoter it's what they do yeah, and really quick and I know people are saying hey well, well Spence was there like it, it was at least for me. It was the understanding was it was a one-sided rematch clause, and and it was highly expected for Tim to win. And the, I think the plan was was for Spence to quote unquote call out Tim Zhu after the fight. He just happened to be there already, so they just kind of did what they did. But I don't know. Um, I'm sticking to my prediction. So yeah, Dave, welcome, brother. We we're just talking about. The whole situation with Samson uh, just going around, talking to all the media members, making his rounds after the fight and saying a lot of different things. First, first it's Errol. Now he's going to honor his word. But is he really honoring his word? Or like like we said, <laughs> did someone pull him aside and say, hey, man, did you read the contract? There is, there is a rematch clause in there. You can't fight Spence next. And, you know, neither guy uh, – Fondora or Zoo that are going to be ready anytime soon. So it makes it does kind of make sense to just do the rematch because they're both coming off injuries. They're not going to be ready again until November. So you might as well just do the rematch. What are your thoughts? What's what's going to happen in your opinion? Well, first of all, hey, I saw that interview you did with Sam with him and uh, awesome job on that interview. I didn't know there was a rematch clause. I thought it was an oral agreement, right? But it does make sense to make that rematch immediately when they are both healthy because that's the fight of the year contender so far. It was a classic throwback performance. As Tim said, he was going to deliver a throwback performance. Unfortunately, the team miscalculated. They, 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 had, they had the biggest miscalculation and it cost them the title. But it wasn't, uh, it wasn't because, you know, it, Tim was handicapped, you know. And uh, obviously there was a handicap that uh, Fundora uh, suffered as well, having a broken nose. I want to see this replayed. I want to see this thing play out again with two healthy fighters. Uh, Tim has this minor blemish, blemish, but so does uh, Fundora after being knocked out in a fight of knockout of the year can candidate from uh, Brian Mendoza. I definitely think that this put matchup could actually make probably just as much money as one of the other opponents, say a Terrence Bud Crawford, if they stage it again in Las Vegas later on in the year or give Tim a shot. And man, bring that fight back to Australia. What do you think, Lee? Do we get the rematch? Do we get a fight in between? How do you think this thing plays out? And where does Crawford fit in all of this? Well, <clears throat> I, I'm with the rest of the panel as far as who 
uh, Fundora should fight next, and that and that is Tim Zoo, for all the reasons that have been said here, and for all the storylines and selling points that could be sold for the rematch uh, that we've discussed before. What if both men weren't injured? Uh, who, who was really the better fighter? Uh, I think what what I think you know when I saw Spence come into the ring after the fight, I, I just went, oh, gosh. You know, I, 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 Spence is coming off a thrashing against Crawford. It's been almost a year since that thrashing occurred. He didn't look like he was in any shape to be uh, available to fight anytime soon, credibly at least. Uh, I thought it was forced, and it, and it had the feel of politics that it's not meritocracy, it's politics. Spence is the guy at PBC. He wants a big fight, and this this was a big fight. What I think will probably happen, or what I logically could happen, throwing all of the variables into the, into the mix, um, we're going to have, what should happen is that Zoo and Fundura fight again, and since the WBO is insistent that Crawford get the shot at the WBO title, I think that Fundura will drop the WBO title and keep the WBC title to fit to fight Zoo. And then to satisfy the PBC's political angles and to satisfy the contractually obligated rematch, have Crawford and Spence fight for the vacant WBO title. You kill two birds with one stone there. It's not ideal, but it does tie up some of the loose ends politically on the PBC side and the contractual side. Do you, do you think that maybe it could be um, Crawford and Lubin for the vacant WBO title, or do you think they'll slide Spence in there? I think if they can get away with sliding Spence in there, they'll slide Spence in there. Okay, interesting. And, and, and I wouldn't put it past the WBC. I don't, well, not the WBO. I wouldn't put it past them for allowing Spence to slide in there as well. I agree. More money, yeah, just like Diesel said. It, it'll, it'll make more money. Spence is a bigger name. They've already fought once. And, and, and they could sell the rematch on the point of, well, shoot, you know, Spence looked absolutely horrible in that fight. This was a completely different Errol Spence than we saw, you know, look. He had the car crash. He fought very well against Danny Garcia. He fought very well against your your Donis Ugas. There was every reason to expect, especially at this big of a fight, a generational fight on a big stage, that Errol Spence would be even better against Terrence Crawford. In fact, I picked Spence to win that fight. Uh, but instead, we got the depleted Errol Spence that probably should have showed up against Garcia or Ugas. So the selling point for a potential rematch with Crawford is, is, is Crawford that, that did Crawford is Crawford as good as he looked last July against Spence and is Spence as bad as he looked against Crawford last July. And um, the answer is probably somewhere in between. Spence can't be that bad again. And Trawford, considering, you know, how easily he beat Spence the first time around, can he rise to those heights again at nearly age 37? So it could be sold yeah. if done right. The selling, the selling, point, the selling point's going to be that Spence is a different man at 154. That's what they're going right. to say. He was That's drained true. at 147. Yeah, okay. So, Lyndon, you're pretty close to the action when it comes to Australian boxing and Tim Zhu. Do you suspect what I'm suspecting, that there probably was a rematch clause in writing and Samson pretty much overlooked that and he was acting on emotion the night of the fight and not really looking at the logistics behind it? And do you feel as though we are going to get this rematch in November? Yeah, I think so. First of all, mate, great uh, interview with uh, Samson. I thought it was great. Um, Thank you. Look, he has done a few different interviews around the traps and it has uh, contradicted himself a few times and uh, backtracked and everything else. But end of the day, I think on the night, I think he admitted it on your your interview that he 
Um, it was a heat of the moment thing at the, at the press conference and uh, he was angry with Team Zoo and don't forget that Tim confronted him at one of the press conferences and I think called him a weasel or something as well. So, uh, so I think in the cold light of day, the next day, maybe they've all taken a deep breath. Maybe someone's been in his ear about, hey, Samson, you just can't go off and start talking about that. We have got uh, arrangements. But on the other hand, too, Team Zoo is a little bit, a little bit all over the place as well because, of course, you've got the cut man copying it, you've got the corner copying it, you've got the promoter copying it, you've got the manager copying it, uh, and then you've got the trainer saying that he's not going to fight till December. So I think in this instance here, um, the fact that both of the guys were so banged up and it was such a tough fight has actually benefited, I know, Tim Zoo because you think about it, if Tim Zoo was out until November or December – of course, Fandora is going to take a fight in that time. The fact he was banged up so bad as well has put him back to the end of the year. So all roads point to those guys, I would say, waiting until later in the year to fight each other. I can't remember who said it before, but I agree. I think the WBO belt will be vacated because I don't think Terence Crawford's going to want to wait until that's sorted out. He's going to want to fight mid-year. Uh, he'll put a lot of pressure on. This is the number one pound-for-pound pound fighter in the world, remember? Um, the WBO poster boy. So I think he will pressure uh, WBO. I think uh, Fundora will drop the belt, fight Tim in uh, December or November, what it might be for the WBC belt. And then I suppose all the shenanigans start. Who fights who for that WBO belt? Is, is it Crawford Spence? Uh, I know Josh Kelly's got to be thrown in the mix as well. He is the number one challenger. At the, we'll be sorry, he'll be dropped to number two. So what happens with that? But look, I think a uh, short answer, yes, I think the rematch happens uh, at the end of the year where it's still got to be decided, of course, whether it's Australia or the States. I, my my thoughts would be that Tim will want to come back to the States here in uh, Las Vegas and he'll want to right the wrong. Um, I know the promoters might want it back in Australia. Maybe his team maybe does, but you've all seen the type of guy that Tim has shown himself to be in the last few weeks. He's a warrior. He wants to fight. He wants to be here in the, in the big smoke. And I would see that he fights... Fundora later in the year, right back here in that Las Vegas. And then I'm not even going to guess what's going to happen with the WBO belt because that's anyone's guess. I just have to reiterate, um, uh, granted, someone may come up with the money, but I'm just going to throw a figure out there, right? But I'm not saying this is what it is, but let's say, let's say Tim, let's say not Tim, uh, Crawford wants $10 million, right? But let's just say that's, let's say it's $8 million. Like, you can't force anyone to pay him that. Like all the, the all the WBO could do is order a purse bit. It, like that's all they could do. And if no promoter puts up the money Crawford wants, then Crawford has one choice: take the money that they offered you. That's the only money that they're offering. And I and maybe I'm wrong about this, but I think it's more likely Crawford says hell to the no to that. If he doesn't get what he wants, then it is Fondura dropping the belt. Um, I know most don't feel this way, but I don't think they're going to drop the belt if they could force a purse bid. And if no one puts up the money that that Crawford wants, then like it's like worth a shot because it could always vacate the belt if they ultimately don't want to fight him and someone does put up the money, right? So all I know is that that the money Crawf Crawford's wanting, to be honest with you, like. A Spence rematch is probably the only match right now on the table that could maybe get him that guarantee. We might just get that, that rematch at 154. Lyndon, since you're the only fighter on the panel, I, I got to ask you, and this is definitely a hypothetical, and I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit, and I apologize. Um, when you, if you had a cut like Tim Zeus and, and, and the blood was going in your eye, would you tell the referee, hey, man, I can't see? Well, no, I would think, especially at the level these guys are at. You've got to remember it's that Warriors code. Sometimes I think in this day and age, it's probably not the smartest thing to do. Uh, look, I think we all agree. I'm not, I am not. missed the start of the show, obviously, so I'm sure you addressed it. But I think we, we would all agree that um, Team Zoo, and I much, much as I love the team, did drop the ball. They should have, um, they should have put an end to the fight and taken the draw. Um, I know Tim's again that worry mentality kicked in, and any fighter at that level is not going to say, I can't see, I don't want to fight. It's just not in a fighter's makeup, it's not, no matter what level you're at, or any elite level, anyway. But I would have thought in that fight, 
him what it needed to be to save himself. As you've seen, he spent the whole fight, or 10 rounds, wiping blood out of his eyes. And this is not water. It's not sweat. It's not something you can just wipe out of your way. It's a thick, sticky liquid in his eyes. So I think the smart thing would have been to do was to – and actually, you've got to remember, too, at the end of the second round, the cut man didn't have a chance to get himself organised because the cut happened right on the bell. So he would have been going up the stairs – already prepared probably just to put a bit of Vaseline on and all of a sudden he's got blood gushing everywhere. But my my thoughts would have been after, well, to give him the third round and after the third round, the corner to have a chat amongst themselves to say, hey, to the cut man, what's the story? The cut man should have been able to say, look, I can't stop this cut. I just cannot stop this cut. So get the doctor and referee involved and stop the fight and live to fight another day. And unfortunately, he was that close to pulling it out. But at the end of the day, in my opinion, I'm sure D Style and I spoke about it as well. They should have taken the draw, lived to fight another day. Thankfully, it looks like this whole rematch thing is going to happen. It's going to work out okay. But um, still, he took that first loss on his record. Uh, but I'm sure he'll, he'll be back bigger, better, and stronger. But to answer your question, mate, yeah, I think any fighter of any note would fight on. They would not want the fight stopped. Okay. So the so the corner basically has to save the fighter from himself exactly. in that in that situation. Fair yeah. enough. Ex- excellent. Thank you. Okay. Shout out to M A W with the five dollar super chat. He says hello, boxing fans, roundtable and chat. Just listening at work. Subscribe, share, smash the like button, please, folks. Awesome. Okay. And I want to also address this comment by Base the Kid. He is exactly right, and we are, we're not going to show the U.K. disrespect because I will have to say Wardley, uh, Fabio Wardley versus Frazier Clark right now, if the year ended, would be my fight of the year. That was a phenomenal, phenomenal fight. Did all of you guys get to see that fight on Sunday? I don't know if you did. I saw it. Did you? Okay. That was a phenomenal fight. Uh, I picked Frazier Clark to win that fight. And I thought if the point was not taken away that he would have won that fight. I don't agree with that point deduction. But Wardley definitely showed heart. You want to talk about a jacked up nose? His nose looked just as bad, if not worse, than Fondor's. And, you know, these guys went back and forth tooth and nail. Um, Clark got off the canvas, suffered two knockdowns, I believe, in the seventh round, if I'm not mistaken. And he, his jab was on point. He boxed a really good fight under pressure under duress and uh, i gotta give credit yeah just just for the record i i was begging b before the show to put it put it but he was like nah we're gonna talk about the uk fights like so so i'm, I'm not sure <laughs> that. um that's defamation but we'll continue on i thought it was a great fight i was i was shocked as i was watching it unfold to be honest the uh i, I wasn't very impressed with with the congo marku fight that was before that but when that fight came on I thought yeah. it was a great matchup. It, you know, you had Big Fraze, and, and he looked like he didn't really want to sit down too heavy in his punches. He was throwing those combinations very well. That uppercut was finding its home, and and then you would just see Fabio with that right hand slow down all that momentum. I thought that point deduction was very unusual because it seemed like it came it's without crazy. warning. All of us, I, yeah, and no I feel like had he not got that point deduction taken away, uh, it could have been the difference. Uh, you know. Uh, I, well, it would have been not, the difference. He would have won yeah. if they didn't take the point away. I'm not mad. I'm not mad at the draw. I'm not mad at the draw because I, I no, can see depending get to see on a how rematch. you it. Yeah, we get yeah, to see I, I hope I hope he gets a rematch at the very least. That was such an awesome fight. Huge for for UK boxing is yeah. I, that, that was an amazing fight. You know, and base says the card, the whole card was phenomenal. It was a good card. I'm not gonna go over to, over the top with the whole card. It was it was a, it was a decent card, but. The, you know, the fight of the night was obviously the main event. The, none of those fights actually lived up any anywhere near as as good as that main event. There were there were decent fights. There were no barn burners on on the undercard. Let's just be honest. All right, so let's jump into another fight here. Richard Hitchens. I don't know if I would call this a step up. I mean, Gustavo Lamas is uh, Argentine fighters twenty twenty nine and zero. But I believe this is his first time fighting outside of Argentina. So I don't know. It, it, on paper, this looks like a tough fight, but is it really? You know, so I, I, I have to 
have to question if, th if this is going to be a, a challenge for, for Hitchens because we thought that the um, the uh, Jose Cepeda fight was going to be a challenge for him, and it most certainly wasn't. So what do you think here, Dave? Do you think this could be a step up for, for Hitchens, or could this be another walk in the park for him? I'm going to agree with you, Beeb. Uh First and foremost, I love seeing new Argentinian fighters that I've never seen. You know, you're, where I'm always waiting for the next Lucas Matisse or the next Sergio Maria Martinez, you know, a great champion to emerge from um, obscurity. But I don't think this is the guy. I think like you just mentioned, it's going to look, he looks great on paper, but he doesn't have that international level of competition that Hitchens has with his amateur pedigree. Uh, Hitchens' problem for me is, is, uh, is, you know, performing for the crowd. You know, he he's so skilled uh, as a boxer that he's kind of in that place where Haney used to be, where he did things so easily with so much ease that it, it's kind of hard to, you know, root for the guy. You want to see more. You want to see him start to finish guys. You want to see him put on a performance other than a clinic. So uh, I think that's what I'm looking forward to this weekend with him on that card there's uh Mark Castro out of Fresno that I'm still interested as a prospect you've got Diego Pacheco who uh really could be somebody special at 168 pounds so overall there's a lot of interesting fighters on that card but I think Richard Hitchison Hitchison's going to win this with ease and uh, and hopefully the Argentinian guy will do his country right and, and put on a classic Argentinian performance and give the guy work you know give him some solid work yeah it, it it kind of seems that this is the way it's going to go, Lyndon. But once again, you know, you look at these fighters on paper, 29-0, and 0, and automatically people assume it's going to be a tough fight. Do you think this is going to be a tough fight for Hitchens? Or did Eddie Hearn, you know, match him up the way he should have matched him up for a 14-0 and 0 fighter? Yeah, I don't think it's a, it's a bad matchup. I think Hitchens has doesn't have a lot of problems in getting past um, – uh, what's his name? Le Lemos, is it? What is it? Lavas? How do you pronounce it? Lamos, I believe. Lamos. Yeah. Look, he's a tough year, uh, Argentinian. I know he's, his record looks pretty good on paper, but look, I, I think Hitchens is, I think he's ranked two or three out of three of the four organizations. So I think it's just a keep busy fight for him. Uh, look, Lemos, he's tough. He wants the fight. I've seen a bit of footage of him. He, um, he does, he, he can bang okay, but I, I think he'll be custom made for, uh, for Hitchens. I think. A pretty easy unanimous decision. I was actually kind of um, actually back in Vegas now. I was trying to actually stay for the fight on Saturday, but unfortunately I've got to go. They wouldn't um, give me an extra day on my ticket, unfortunately, or the airlines. But um, now look, it should be good. I'm, I'm actually uh, interested in the undercard. We've got Sky Nicholson fighting for the WBC uh, featherweight title, so that should be a good uh, test for her. And hope she can she can um, put a little bit of uh, joy into Australian fight fans after the last few days with uh, the three uh, that we had last weekend. Yeah, what do you think, D. Stell? Is this pretty much a showcase fight, or what do you think? Because the zone, I don't know. A lot of these the zone cards, these Eddie Hearn cards, I, I'm seeing a lot of kind of showcase cards here, and I, I just kind of get the sense that this may be another one of those showcase type cards again. Uh, look, um, I know this guy could, could crack. He knocked out Lee Selby. Um, he has a lot of knockouts in his record, but but then again, this was Lee Selby in 2022, right? In fairness, <laughs> but um, so so obvious, but like I don't think he's gonna win, but but I do think he's gonna have some moments in this fight. Um, the problem with with Hitchens, like for me, um, and sometimes these 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 pure boxers, it takes me a while to be sold. Uh, to them, I, I know, like most people are the opposite. Most people just fall in love with the pure boxers, and they, and they, you know, they, they anoint them a lot earlier than they should, in my opinion. But um, I thought Joan Zapata was going to give Hitchens some problems. Now, it didn't turn out that way. But after watching Joan Zapata's last fight, I'm, I'm wondering how much was left of Joan Zapata. Like, like you know, what I mean, I, I'm just that I, I have questions about that. And, and the one thing I know for sure is that uh, I believe it's pronounced Lemos, but I'm not sure. Um, if, if anything, Gustavo, which I can't pronounce, right? It's first time leaving Argentina, um, and he's he's got nothing to lose, and a man with nothing to lose is a dangerous man, right? 
And I think he's going to be willing to take some of Hitchens' punches to, to try to march forward and, and, and push him and, and, and kind of force him to put more punches together. You know, like, because the one thing with Hitchens is he always claims he could have gotten the knockout if he wanted to very easily, but he just didn't have to. Like, he, I, I, I seem like he keeps saying that. And, I, and I'm like, well, if, if you could have knocked out Zepeda, you would have, right? Like, you keep saying, he keeps saying he could have easily done it, but you didn't do it. So could you have done it? I don't know, man. Like I, I'm not that sold on Richardson uh, Hitchens. I got to be honest with you. Um, I, I question his punching power. And if someone can walk through his punches, well, it'll be interesting to see. I thought, I thought that Peter would be that guy. He just, you know, it just wasn't the same. So, so I think I, I anticipate, a tougher than expected, but a clear win, though, for Richardson Hitchens. Um, he wins another dual decision. I think it might be tough early. He takes over the second half, and uh, that'll be that. But uh, I hope this is a test. I hope, you know, that this, there's a moment of – I'm hoping Lemos can, can give him a good fight and maybe land some big shots and see how Hitchens reacts to that because I need to see how he reacts to that. You know what I mean? So those are my thoughts. What do you think, Lee? Do you think that Lemos could push Hitchens? Because Hitchens, if you don't push him, he will he will, he will kind of go to go into cruise control. Do you think you know, Lemos can take him out of cruise control in this fight? Well, he's going to have to try because uh, he's five feet, five and a half inches tall. He's got very short arms. So the only chance that he really has to win is to uh, to get inside those long arms, push him up against the ropes, whack the body, and stay there. And there is some significance attached to this particular matchup because it's being billed as an IBF title eliminator at 140 pounds. Hitchens is rated third. Uh, the, the first two spots are vacant, of course. That's the IBF's way of doing things. And, and Lemos is ranked seventh. So uh, there is at least uh, some justification of why this pairing is being made anyway. Um he, I, I watched some film of Lemos in doing some uh, research for CompuBox. Uh, he's very aggressive. He has heavy hands, and um, he, and he, he does have he does have some power. Uh, but his his blueprint print is very very clear, as is Hitchens' uh, blueprint. Um, he has a hard and accurate jab. He moves well. He's very smart. He's an excellent ring general. He does what he does very well. Um, but here's the rub, I think. Lemos is fighting for only the second time since the aforementioned fight against Lee Selby. That was in March 2022. And in that time, he's only fought 40 seconds of official action since then. Uh, you have to wonder how much ring rust is going to affect him. And in... Richardson Hitchens, he's going up against a guy with an Olympic pedigree, and he can dominate fights from long range. Uh, I, I think the fight will will swing on the man who imposes his pace and his distance on the other man. And I think that Richardson Hitchens is going to be that guy. I, I was actually impressed by what I saw of Hitchens. Um, I think that he'll probably get the W over 12. But if the difference in pedigree is long is, is big enough, and since they have 12 rounds to work with, there is a possibility of a late round TKO. Okay. You know, Jeff, a lot of people, they're not big on Richard Richardson's style. And I think – Guys like Hitchens, guys like Shakur Stevenson, I, I think they need the right opponent. Do you think Lamos is the right opponent to kind of make this fight aesthetically pleasing for the fans? I sure hope so. I sure hope so. I, I, I'm I, kind of along what D-Style was saying. Uh, I love a good technical boxer. You know, there's... When art gets too technical, you lose the common viewer. You know, when music gets too technical, you know, you get into like jazz fusion or you get into like symphony, you know. People want to hear like simple bass lines, percussions, like, you know, a nice air guitar or whatever the hell. 
you know that you're you're, you're not going to get a hundred thousand people in a in a a Russian stadium to listen to classical. They're going to want to hear Metallica or DMX. You know they want people. They're they're once boxing gets too complicated, you lose the common viewer. I can appreciate the sweet science as someone that practices it and lives this thing. Like I understand it, but on the same token, it all falls under the umbrella of entertainment, and I, I will never never vouch for a fighter that does not take into consideration that boxing fans by and large are blue collar hardworking people that don't really have a thousand don't have that fifteen hundred two thousand dollars to go to las vegas to go to a fight out of state to buy those tickets that cost seven hundred dollars to get up close to see a game of grown man tag like so i am a little slow to warm up to i was slow to warm up to Shaki foster like I, I saw his fight against yakubov from vargas and was like, damn, he's technical, but this is hard to watch. And then he pulls out that Rocky Hernandez fight, and you're like, damn, I like this guy. Ray Ford, same thing. He had that draw with Perez, and then, you know, he has that very questionable win against Eduardo Vasquez. And then you saw him kind of level up. I think it was, it was a, uh, I don't remember who it was the last fight, but then he had that fight with Kolmatov, and you were like, yo, this kid Ray Ford is the truth. So I'm, I'm hoping. With Richardson Hitchens, we get one of those performances. I saw when he fought Juan Bowser. They all came up big in the amateur ranks. Him, Shakur, Juan Bowser out there in the Northeast. And he pieced him up nasty and pretty much ruined that kid's career over 10 rounds or however long it was they fought. And then he had that fight against Chon Zepeda. And that fight was hor horrible. How does Canelo say it? Horrible. Horrible. I, 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 horrible. And, and, and I get it. It was a clinical masterpiece. But I think fans really need to set aside their need to troll online and to be right in the comment sections and just keep it real about people needing to be entertained. Like we're, we're, we're going to war with these savages as far as entertainment dollars with these guys in the octagon that are just basically swinging bows at each other and bleeding for pennies. Like, and we're not going to get new fans to the sport with those kind of performances, what he did against Chon Zepeda. Now, Gustavo Lemos is tailor-made for a guy like Richardson Hitches to just piece up. Gustavo Lemos, to me, is like, you know, who was that kid that, that uh, Ryan Garcia, Oscar Duarte, like very similar style. Heavy-handed, has to plant his feet down to land his shots, cuts off the ring. You know, he pretty much put Lee Selby out to pasture, but Lee Selby has had a long career, been in some tough ones. He's in his 30s. You know, you got to love the Argentinians. The Argentinians... You know, with the few exceptions of like Sergio Martinez, most Argentinians tend to sit down in their punches and tend to bring the pain. When you get a puncher against a boxer, boxer I can favor. It's always hard not to favor the boxer. It might be a snooze fest. I think just stylistically, Richardson Hitchens' skill set is up there. That that kid is his skill set is insane. He can fight on the front foot. He can fight on the back foot. His timing, his countering. He's got fast twitch muscles up the wazoo. But but I will never rally behind a fighter who is content you know taking a hot stinky doo-doo all over fans and all over the ring just to win a fight and not not really give us our entertainment dollars value ultimately please entertain the damn crowd are you not entertained no i'm not when it when it's that i don't want to see fucking tag so i do believe that regardless of how defensive they get when they see these comment sections online, because we're in a new era with social media, fighters like Richard Hitchens, fighters like Shakur Stevenson, they get immediate feedback. They don't got to wait until the next day when they decide to open up a newspaper in a sports section and see what Sports Illustrated or, or the New York Times has to say. They just turn on their phone. Oh, damn, I crapped the bed on this one. And, and I refuse to believe that Richard Hitchens or Shakur Stevenson doesn't see it and they don't feel bad like, damn, because they, they know that they're talented. They know they're talented. And like, what is that? Like, you know, Floyd had earned that right to be the freeze tag guy. He he earned the right to be grown man tag through all the dues and all the divisions he paid the dues as pretty boy Floyd to make the whole world hate him, to invest in money to want to see if this next flat-footed puncher can stop that dude. Now, if you if if guys like Richardson Hitchens hope to secure generational wealth, hope to become that dude that's just the most hated guy. You know what I'm saying? Then they're going to have to put in some work and knock a few heads and crack some of those eggs and spill some yolk. So I think Richardson Hitchens is going to take all that feedback he got from that little freeze tag performance he did 
against Chon Zepeda and give us something awesome. If he doesn't, at the very least, I think we're going to have a 118, 110 performance. Clear, wide, unanimous decision for Richardson Hitchens because Gustavo Lamon just has never stepped outside of Argentina and he doesn't seem like a Madonna to me. Got it, got it. All right. Dave, we went to you already, right? On this Everybody one? Went. Okay. Switch it up on me without, without me uh, trying to pull a fast one over there. All right, so we, we're going to go to the last topic, and we always seem to be having a Canelo topic every week. And uh, we're going to have another one this week as well. It's not, nothing new for this time. So let's go back to Samson Lukowitz. Um Another thing he said during that interview was that if after Canelo fights Ami Mangia and say May 5th or even a week later or two weeks later, he says, okay, I'll fight David Benavides in September. Samson Lukowitz said that they would scrap that Alexander Vosdick fight and they would go right for Canelo Alvarez. So the ball is in Canelo Alvarez's court. One day he says that the fight's dead, um, Samson Lukowitz. Another day he says, oh, we could still do it. And something tells me that that fight is still going to happen in September. Something tells me that that Vosdick fight may get canceled because there's not even really a date yet. They haven't announced a date, a venue. And it I just believe that they're waiting to see what Canelo does after Jaime Munguia. And Canelo said he's got a big surprise, uh, you know, for, you know, on that night to, after the Jaime Munguia fight. So will will he announce, hey, I'm going to be fighting David Benavides in September if he wins? What do you think, Lee? Am I being a little overly optimistic here? Am I digging my reach? And am I being a conspiracy theorist here? Or is there something true to what I'm saying? I think there is something to what you're saying because, it, you know, when the fight with Jaime Munguia was announced, it was, it was, you know, I said that it's probably the third best fight. It, it is the best fight that Canelo can take, not named David Benavides or David Morrell, because Jaime Munguia is ranked by two, two, he's ranked number one by two of the organizations, so he has to fight him. And two, Munguia's style would provide a nice dress rehearsal for a possible David Benavides fight because Munguia is tall. He brings the action. He throws lots of punches. And uh, if Canelo shows well in this fight, if he's dominant and maybe even if he stops Munguia, that'll give him the juice to say, okay, I can, I can, you know, I've always done well against guys who are six foot or taller. And um, Munguia fills that bill. If I dominate Munguia, that would be a nice dress rehearsal for a Benavides fight. And, and you know, he said, uh, the way it was phrased, I believe, that uh, he says he has a surprise for the Mexican fans. Well, what, what better way, what better surprise for the Mexican fans than to announce out of the blue, okay, I've listened to y'all. I'm going to fight Benavides in September. Um, and you know, so uh, yeah, I, I think that uh, that that makes perfect sense. Uh, hopefully, it does happen. Uh, as far as the other surprises, uh, we we talked about David Morrell. That's a very attractive fight. But uh, also, what about the aforementioned Terence Crawford? Uh, you know, Crawford hasn't had anything uh, so uh, nailed down yet. Uh, there is that situation at, at 154. But if he is shut out of the 154 conversation, then the next biggest fight, and Crawford is always talking about getting the big money, the biggest money fight that Crawford could possibly get is against Canelo. And given that Crawford and Canelo are about the same height, Terrence Crawford actually has a four inch longer reach. I, I think that a fight at 154 for Crawford would make sense because then he would show that he can handle a heavier weight. And, and 154 is seven pounds closer to 168 than 147 is. So, um, but the main question is, is Crawford going to be big enough and strong enough to deal with Canelo at 168? Canelo is thicker and stronger and hits harder at the weight. But the, 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 the size difference is not, not so much. And, and Crawford's a good boxer. He's a disciplined boxer. He's a young 30. He would be almost 37 if they 
if they meet in September. Crawford's a young 37. Canelo is an older 34. You know, so that fight would make sense and it would qualify as a big surprise. But but I do think that uh, your theory about David Benavides being next, possibly, it does make sense to me. Am I a sage D style? Am I clairvoyant? Do I see something in the future that others don't see? What do you think? I think it's the Benavides fight. Um, this whole thing just reeks of it's it's like deja vu from 2000, I believe it was 2017 uh, or 16, whatever year it was. When they announced the uh, the fight with Golovkin, um, they had already done the deal with Golovkin, and um, and. And then they plan to announce it right after the uh, Chavez Jr. fight. Um, and I think that's that's now granted in this case, you have the fight with Vajdik, so I, it's kind of iffy. But I, I will venture to say that it's going to be the Benavides fight. It doesn't mean it has to be in September. It might be later or something. But um, but I think next it's going to be the Benavides fight, and I think that's the quote-unquote surprise. I could be wrong. If it's not that, if it's some stupid like I'm launching a new drink in Guadalajara or something, like I'm gonna be pissed as fuck. Okay, oh, I, I'm launching this new. Uh, I'm opening new gas stations, guys. Like, like, I mean, who knows, right? Like, um, it, it's who knows what he the surprise might be, but uh, it, it might be it, it could be anything, right? But I'm guessing it's boxing related. I'm guessing it's an opponent. I'm guessing it's a fight we want. And I hope that's what it is, quite frankly. Um, and, and yeah, I could easily see them saying, hey, Vajdik, here's some step-aside money, and uh, we got to do what we got to do, and to get that fight on. Um, another interesting take is what Bass has posted. Maybe he announces, yeah, I'm, the, yeah, I'm super champion. I want to fight the winner of uh, Bivol versus Better Beef. I don't know. If that's a good idea, but but like I guess that that's a possibility. But I I just don't like Canelo one seventy five. That's just me. Um, I think the I think the Kovalev win was a good win, but but again, it was an older Kovalev, and and it's just you know I don't know. If we want to fight two, these two monsters at one seventy five. Like I think everyone has, even great fighters reach a point where okay, that's too much, right? And I just think for Canelo, that's what it is. But who knows, right? He might be crazy enough to do it. But I think it's going to be a mini this fight. I think that's the, maybe that's wishful thinking. Um, but that's my guess. Yeah, it seems to me like both these guys, Lennon, they, they're kind of like playing playing the fans against each other. I, I, I just think something's ruined behind the scenes. And I think this fight is on the table for September. I, I, I've always said that. I've said that for about the last seven or eight months. Am I wrong? No, well, let's, let's hope um, it does take place. I, I, I do agree with these style. Actually, I was thinking the same thing. Is he going to announce a drink or a clothing line or, or something along those lines? But uh, look, I suppose, look, he's, he's, he's almost ruled Crawford out. I suppose uh, to us fans out there uh, in, in the in the past few weeks or months, whatever it's been, that he's not really interested in that fight. Nothing to gain, he says. And Benavides, um, yeah, well, I mean that's a logical fight, but whether it happens or not, we'll see. But I, I, I don't know. I, I would love to see it in in um, in September, but uh, let's just hope it's not a Jamal Charlo rematch or whatever. I mean, who, who knows? But. I, I hope it's Benavides. Uh, I think he's earned his shot. I don't think he'll go to 175. I know it's been sort of put out there a little bit, but I think his experience at, at uh, elite level 175, I know Kovalev was 175, but he was well past his peak. I think he, the taste of Bivol might have just turned him away from the 175 pound division. And I think heaven help him if uh, better be if beats Bivol and he had to fight him because I think that would be even uglier. But um, I think he'll stay at 168. Uh, the other thing is is whether Benavides wants to hang around. I, I don't know whether you saw the interview. I think it was on Pro Box TV the other day, where with Samson, um, that uh, the language he was using was that that fight would never happen. So it's it's intriguing times, but I don't think there's any other fight for Canelo in September. If Crawford's out of the picture, I just don't see who else he could he could fight that would satisfy the fans. Um, I think Mangi is a good fight. And Benavides would be the cherry on top, but uh, that, I think it's got to be that or or, um, or or nothing. It's the only fight that really makes sense. What do you think, Jeff? You think the big announcement's going to be there's going to be a new Canelo candy bar that he's going to announce, or do you think it's going to be Benavides? 
y'all y'all are overanalyzing this. I think Canelo's going to walk out to Los Tucanes de Tijuana, and that's what the big announcement was. And he's going to clown Jaime Munguia with the biggest banda from Tijuana just to rub salt in the wound. But no, I, that, that was a joke. I, I, don't, I don't know what he's going to do next. I don't think any of us really do. But I can say that I, I'm actually on record since last November talking this Jaime Munguia, David, David Benavidez path. And then Terrence Crawford and a possible rematch would be evolved beyond that. And rest assured, I'm going to spam the hell out of my clairvoyant skills if this actually goes down the way I've been talking about it going down since last November. After the Jamel fight, uh, yeah, so I, I, I think this is common knowledge. My coach, we're in San Diego. We, we have a strong business and working relationship with No Boxing, No Life. Eddie advises a lot of fighters in my gym. Um, they open up on the bottom of those PBC pay-per-view events with Canelo. I asked... You know, coach to ask Eddie, and Eddie said after the Jamel fight, ah, we're looking at either Jamal Charlo or Jaime Munguia. That was what he said. And I said, there ain't no fucking way it's going to be Jamal. So I was automatically on a trade. It's going to be Jaime, and then we're getting David. And I've been talking this since early last, since late last year. So I would be to the moon if it was David in September. And I've always thought it's going to be David coming up next. It was D. Style that said this reeks of the Gennady Golovkin. This reeks of the Triple G Canelo announcement. This reeks of Mayweather Pac-Man. That same stench in the air. Everybody is lying through their damn teeth. And everyone's got conflicting stories and nothing makes sense. Nothing Canelo makes sense coming out with them sunglasses lying to the cameras. He never wears sunglasses. Samson can't keep it coherent through an interview. Jose Sr. can't keep it coherent through an interview. Dave Benavidez... Is on fresh and fit. Nothing he says really makes any damn sense. I'm like, oh yeah, they're all lying. They're covering it up. My spidey senses have been saying that they're going to get that fight in September. So that that's what I think is going to happen. But I don't think there's a special announcement. I think I think Canelo's just stringing everyone along. I think it's always been in the plan because ain't no way in hell. Like boxing people are so trivial. They're so power hungry and money hungry and egotistical. They don't take, they don't take like a, a shortcut. Like if we've been at the bargaining table for years and I'm trying to get this generational wealth in this fight with Canelo, I'm Team Benavidez. Oh, I don't see Eddie saying, "Hey, no, but here's a spit in your eye. You could take our sparring partner, this Russian guy, the nail." That that's not how it works. They weren't like, "Sure, spit right here in my eyeball. Let's go." No, we want the generational wealth with the Canelo fight. No, we don't care about your boy Valstick. If the, if the Volstick fight does go down, it's part of the deal to get the Canelo fight. There was no way in 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 hell that they agreed to fight Volstick without at least getting some kind of guarantee or some kind of backdoor deal to where they're going to fight Canelo because who the hell negotiates like that in this day and age in boxing? It's either all or nothing with both teams. They either get exactly what they want or nobody wants to negotiate. People don't take concessions in boxing negotiations. Dave, I, I honestly don't see... Who else is left after Jaime Munguia? I mean, what are we going to do fight David Morrell? I mean, like, Crawford's going to be at 154. It's a no-brainer. It's got to be David, right? Well, there's some exciting prospect contenders. I mean, there's Mbilly, uh, an international Olympian like that. And Billy's uh, – there's David Pacheco potentially down the line. These are all – I mean, they're not household names, and that's the problem, right? But what about this uh, report that uh, David Benavides will be fighting in Houston with Gervonta Tank Davis on the card in June? What about that? That that doesn't leave any room for David Benavides to heal and get back in shape for a, a mega September and Mexican Independence Day showdown. It just doesn't leave any time for that, right? So you're speculating that that fight is all huff and puff and it's probably not going to uh, happen. But I honestly think that the, that fight between David Benavides and Zvodzik is is actually a ploy by uh, Canelo Alvarez to to gather data, to get some data, and you know, gather the data. You know, like he's out there to collect all the data on what David Benavides is going to bring to the table. I actually think it's genius to allow David Benavides to balloon up another weight class. Uh, it happened. History kind of repeats itself. Chad Dawson, you guys remember, fought in Oakland, fought our Andre Ward out of the Bay Area came down from 175 and was completely ineffective. And I think history has a pattern of repeating itself, and I think it'd be a brilliant move by Canelo to let the guy go up there, try out the weight class, 
and let's see him struggle to come back down to 168 because they're generally never the same fighter. It always takes takes some something out of you. And David Benavides is already a guy who's busting at the seams at 168. I think it'd be a genius move. I find it hard to believe that fight can happen in September if David Benavides does take that fight date on June 22nd. Now, if they do have this fight, which every boxing fan wants, right? Ernesto Amador told me in D-Style that this is the fight the fans want, and we deserve this fight, especially Mexicans. We deserve this fight. The only way I can think of that Canelo's going to get that money he's talking about in those press conferences, $100 million, blah, 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 is to host that fight in Las Vegas at the Allegiant Stadium. D-Style seen it, seen the Magnificent Beast this weekend, past weekend. It's a magnificent stadium, and that's the only way I can even conceive of Canelo Alvarez making that type of feria, making that gate. I mean, you know, a $100 million fight uh, deserves a spectacular venue, and I think uh, if you do have that fight, it's got to be right here in Las Vegas at the Allegiant Stadium. I, I don't know, Dave. I just think they're going to scrap that Vosdick fight. Something tells me that because they don't even have the date announced yet. I, I don't know, man. I don't know. Anything can happen, but we'll see. All right, that'll do it. Thank you, everyone in the chat. Thank you, everyone on the panel. This was a great show, great discussion, and we will see you next week on D-Style Boxing's channel. Everyone have a good night. Have a good night. Peace out, everyone.